Hello, BookTube. I have a little more mail. Amazingly. It's not as much as yesterday, but it is two boxes. And one of the boxes, I believe, is from one of you. It doesn't look like it comes from a, from a publisher. But the first one does. The first one is definitely from a publisher. It has a pull tab and everything. Uh, a pull tab that won't work. <laughs> everything. So let's just skip the pull tab and rip this open. Uh, this is probably a finished copy. And I have my disposal unit is ready. <laughs> is ready. <laughs> I don't know if you saw, but one of the, one of the things that this little dog does that I absolutely love, you just maybe glimpsed it or you can rewind, is that when she's really intensely interested in something, whether it's tearing apart cardboard, tearing apart mail, tearing apart the feet of my surly houseboy, she will, when she's really interested and really excited, she won't just lunge with her mouth. She waves with her hands as well. Her front paws in the air. It's hilarious. I love it. All right, so let's see. Let's see what we have here. This is indeed a finished copy of something. Uh, oh my. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> oh, oh goodness. <sighs> okay, this is from Baylor University. They're great folks. Great. And they're every season. When you get the catalog or the list of Baylor books, there are items on that list that you have got to have. They are so good. Uh, <laughs> this could very well be one of those books. It isn't something that I requested. Uh, <laughs> Alright, well, <laughs> this is by Gary Dorian, and it is called In a Post-Hegelian Spirit. Philosophical Theology as Idealistic Discontent. I'm guessing no giant prehistoric killer sharks. So let's learn about the perpetrator. I mean the author. <laughs> uh, do we know Gary Dorian is the Reinhold Niebuhr professor? Well, of course he is. He's not the Mary McCarthy professor, is he? Uh, of Social Ethics at Union Theological Seminary and Professor of Religion at Columbia University. Good Lord. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, I don't have a pub sheet for this thing, and it's all right. It wouldn't have been in recognizable English anyway, so let's read the dust jacket, as you will be reading when you grab for this thing on the new release table of your Barnes & Noble. <laughs> uh, Gary Dorian expounds in this book the religious philosophy underlying his many magisterial books on modern theology, social ethics, and political philosophy. His constructive position is liberal liberationist and post-Hegelian. Good to know reflecting his many years of social justice activism and what he calls, quote, my dance with Hegel. Okay. <laughs> hey. uh, it, was, it was a dance with Hegel that prompted me to my fourth divorce from Deb. Uh, Hegel, he argues, broke open the deadliest assumptions of Western thought by conceiving being as becoming and consciousness as social subjective relation of spirit to itself. Yet his white Eurocentric conceits were grotesquely inflated even by the standards of his time. Dorian emphasizes both sides of this Hegelian legacy. First time in my life that I wish that noise were louder. <laughs> uh, uh, contending that it takes a great deal of digging and refuting to recover the parts of Hegel that still matter for religious thought. By distilling his signature argument about the role of post-Kantian idealism, how did I know that Kant was going to get lugged in here at some point or other, uh, in modern Christian thought, Dorian fashions a, liberal, a liberationist form of religious idealism, a religious philosophy that is simultaneously both Hegelian, as it expounds a fluid, holistic, open, intersubjective, ambiguous, tragic, and reconciliatory idea of revelation, and post-Hegelian, as it rejects the deep-seated flaws in Hegel's thought. Dorian mines Kant, Schleiermacher, and Hegel as the foundation of his argument about intellectual intuition and the creative power of subjectivity. No, wait, there's more. <laughs> Analyzing critiques of Hegel by Soren Kierkegaard, Karl Marx. Wouldn't be a party without Marx, would it? Karl Barth and Emmanuel Levinas Dorian contends that though these argument that though these monumental figures were penetrating in their assignments in their assessments, uh, they appear one-sided compared to Hegel. In a post-Hegelian spirit, that's the name of the book. In a post-Hegelian spirit, further engages with the personal idealistic tradition 
founded by Borden Parker Bowen, the process tradition founded by Alfred North Whitehead, and the daring cultural contributions of Paul Tillich, W.E. Du Bois, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosemary Radford Reuther, David Tracy, Peter Hodgson, Edward Farley, Catherine Keller, and Monica Coleman. Dispelling common interpretations of Hegel's theology, yeah, there are probably plenty of common, you probably have one yourself. Uh, dispelling common interpretations of Hegel's theology simply fashioned a closed system. Dorian argues instead that Hegel can be inter interpreted legitimately in six different ways. Not one, not two, but six. Six different ways. And he's best interpreted as a philosopher of love who developed a Christian theology, theodicy of love divine. Hegel expounded a process theodicy of God salvaging what can be salvaged from history, even as his tragic sense of carnage of history cuts deep, lingering at Calvary. Okay, <laughs> all right, and there's a, there's a large number of, uh, of blurbs on the back. The whole back is blurbs. Interestingly enough, uh, one of the blurbs is by David Ray Griffin who is here referred to as Emeritus Professor of Philosophy and Religion and Theology at the Claremont School of Theology and Claremont Graduate University and not referred to as one of the primary 9-11 truthers for a good 10 years. David Ray Griffin made a substantial side hustle, as the kids call it today, uh, by giving lectures, pointing out the flaws in the official, in the government story about what happened on 9-11. So I guess his reputation did not suffer because he was solicited for a blurb for a book on post-Hegelian spirit. <laughs> what is his blurb? Let's see, because he always used to joke in those lectures, on that lecture tour, he always used to say, people would ask him, what happens if, if the government, you know, admits everything that you're saying, admits that there are huge problems in this official story, what will you do? And he said, well, then I'll quit, and I'll go back to writing my systemic, uh, my system of theology. And the audience just laughed, but apparently he did that. Uh, let's see. What is, what is his blurb? Dorian's book exemplifies liberal theology, and its scope is enormous, running from Kant, Hegel, and Schleiermacher, there he is again, uh, to liberation theology, to Whiteheadian process theology. It is a book that truly deserves to be called a tour de force. Okay. <laughs> it's not a tour de force anywhere in Steve's wheelhouse whatsoever. <laughs> not only because I think philosophy is a gigantic bucket of hogwash, but because all of this is how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. There are no gods. <laughs> there is no supernatural. None of it is real. <laughs> it's all a human construct, and all of it is a construct of human egotism. So none of this is important. None of it matters. All of this is palavering based on this stuff being true. It's not. It's obviously not true. <laughs> it's obviously not true. Hundreds of millions of Cro-Magnons had deeply evolved and seriously personal religious beliefs. They're all dead. They're all, their gods are all gone. They don't exist. Do gods die? No. You're saying the Cro-Magnons had the wrong gods. Oh, well, you're saying that about everybody, right? The ancient Navajo had gods, a gigantic pantheon of them. Of them, They worshipped them. Every one of them had their own rites and rituals, their own specialties. Not only are those gods all gone, but those gods are all different from the gods that most Navajos worship today. To say nothing of the world's Buddhists, <laughs> right? Or, or the world's Hindus. You don't know anything about their gods. They have elaborately defined religious rituals about those gods. They are completely convinced those gods are real. Just as convinced that you are that your gods are real. And the reason for that isn't because one of you is wrong and one of you is right. It's because none of you are right. There are no gods. There is no supernatural element to life. No one's ever been able to show it. No one's ever been able to prove it. No one's ever been able to demonstrate it in any way. Ever. <laughs> Even once. That means it's not real, <laughs> right? In the same way that dragons or unicorns aren't real. The reason we know they're not real is not because no one we happen to know has seen one. It's because they've never been proven to be real. Never. So all of this, all of this is elaborating on a system of thought that is based on assumptions that are... It doesn't matter, right? And on one level, it doesn't matter. A book like this that went into this kind of source-quoting, elusive, heavily German reading about the myth, the legendarium of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, I would read. Even though I would know from the start that it's all based on fiction. The only difference here is that <laughs> that's not going to be cre credited by anybody in this book. It's still all based on fiction. It's still all, ba all based on mythology. But <laughs> there's two things. So I'm getting a heavy helping of two things here. 
philosophy and religion. <sighs> There's got to be somebody who would prefer this book, who would get more out of it than I would. There's got to be. And if you are that somebody, the price of admission, this is probably a very expensive book. I don't, I don't have a price for it. Uh, do, I, do I have a price for it? I've got an invoice here. New in your bookstore when you hurry to your Barnes & Noble to get this. Uh, oh, no, no, this is, well, it's comped, so the, the, the invoice doesn't give the price. Uh, but I bet it's a lot. I bet it's $70, something like that. And the price for sending it in the mail is a review. If you're willing to review this for me, I'm willing to send it to you. Uh, <laughs> even theoretically, I'm talking about reviewing it for Open Letters Review, the literary journal where I am uh, one of the editors. And theoretically, one of the editors on the masthead of Open Letters is in a perfect position to review this book. But somehow I think he won't. <laughs> somehow I think he'll claim he's too busy. Maybe it'll fall on me. I'll certainly read it. I, if Baylor University is going to send me something, I'm going to read it. But oh my, talk about a book that is not in Steve's wheelhouse. <laughs> but anyway, so that was the book from the publisher. Uh, once again, in a post-Hegelian spirit. Who knows what the Tom Cruise movie will retitle it but that's what the title of the book is. And then we have a box, and the box is just priority mail. So I have a feeling that it came from one of you. And I think I might even know which one of them. Uh, so let's, let's see what we have here. Uh, I think one of you uh, wrote to me and said, I know that you have recently reimposed your ban of sending Steve books in the mail. I loosened that ban for a while when we were all stuck in quarantine. So I figured if you're sending something from a warehouse, you know, that's fine. Go right. I'm not going to the Brattle Bookshop and other used bookstores anymore, so you might as well. There wasn't really a whole lot of sense in that softening of the band, but recently I have I have reinstituted the band because the, books, the Brattle Bookshop is back open here in Boston. The retail bookstores are back open here in Boston. I, there is no reason for anybody to be sending me books, so I recently laid down the boom and said, you cannot send me books anymore. But one of you sent me an email and said, I have books in mind. Here's what they are. May I send them to you? And that worked. <laughs> that worked. These are two Penguin classics. Uh, oh boy, thank you so much. Uh, the first one is The Erotic Poems of Ovid, uh, which we did on the, uh, our, uh, we saw a lot of Ovid in our March of the Penguins, but I don't think we saw this volume. This is translated by the great classicist Peter Green, and it is, uh, what will be in here. The Amores, The Art of Love, Cures for Love, and On Facial Treatment for Ladies. So this has, this has a lot of great stuff. And Peter Green is a fantastic, this is probably loaded with notes, right? Yes, it is. It's loaded with notes. You can't shut him up when it comes to notes. You almost get the impression, and you might be right, that he likes annotating these things better than he likes translating them. But this is a huge introduction and tons of loving notes, so that is fantastic. And another one is something that I speculated did exist or maybe should have, should exist in a Penguin Classic. When we were doing our Penguin Classic wall and we were talking about Samuel Johnson, I went banging on about how, you know, they, they do everything for Johnson, uh, lots of stuff connected with him and Boswell, but they don't do the dictionary that was the source of his fame. Uh, and I, even during that video, I was thinking maybe they do a, 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 an abridgment of his dictionary and I just don't know about it. And I, and I got emails and messages from people left, right, and center saying, yes, Penguin does a, a, a version. And, uh, this is that. Uh, so fantastic. This is a Penguin Classic I've never had before. This is edited by David Crystal, and this is a Dictionary of the English Language and Anthology, Samuel Johnson. Look at that. Incredible. Just incredible. And one of you was out shopping and found both of these in perfect condition and emailed if you could send them to me. And I said yes, but don't let that, don't, don't let this fool you. The ban is still in effect, <laughs> but this, how was I going to say no to two Penguin Classics that I don't have and that I want from two of my favorite authors? So you know who you are. Thank you very much for these. I will be reading both of them today. Uh, so there you go. That was the mail. We have in the post-Hegelian spirit and, and two Penguin Classics that are absolute bullseyes. So the yin and yang of the mail here. So that is, that is fantastic. What a day in the mail. Uh, I will take a yin and yang like that any day. And who knows, perhaps Professor Dorian will appeal to me. You never know. I, even though the book is not in my wheelhouse, I will certainly read it. I've read Hegel, so I, I haven't read this Sheila Myler person, but I've, unfortunately I've read Kant, and I've also read Hegel, so I'll give it a try. <laughs> so there's your mail for a Saturday. How nice. So I'm going to wrap this up. 
Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.